This inaugural lecture will be followed by as many as eight more during this academic year, mm -hmm. along with many smaller related events. I hope you will be able to participate in many of these. Information about future events will soon be available on my website as well as on the campus calendar and in the Aggie. Finally, please remember that you're all invited to remain for a reception in the hall immediately following Professor Burroway's lecture. I believe that we have a pretty clear understanding of Professor Burroway's topic, and I'm certain that you're eager for me to get out of the way and let the program proceed. I promise to do that. But because this is the first in our series of Provost Forums, I wanted to say a few words about how this new series came about and what it's designed to do. In my view, it's axiomatic that university have, universities have a special relationship to the past and to tradition. Every society looks to universities to play a strong role in preserving and transmitting what is valuable in both, usually in the face of indifference or even opposition among the general public. Indeed, in many ways, universities embody the past and tradition, as can be seen in the caps and gowns we wear at commencement. In doing so, they also uh, embody stability. At the same time, and, and somewhat paradoxically, one of the things that most excite us about universities and command both our admiration and our investment, investments of all sort, is their powerful identification with the present and with the future. We look to universities and institutions uniquely qualified to make sense of the current historical moment and to help us improve the condition of people all around the world. We look to universities to lead the way into the future with new knowledge, new ideas, and even new systems of ideas. A university that fails to lead in these ways is irrelevant and falls short in its service to society and to its individuals. So our thinking about universities and what we want them to be is best described as a dynamic and wondrously productive balance of old and new, of traditional and of innovative. I want this idea of dynamic balance to inform our collective thinking on public universities and their role in society. <coughs> in fact, that I'll pick up in just a moment. But now permit me to make a second observation that regardless of what we want universities to be, they are in fact embedded in the so-called real world, in their historical moment. And so their structures and practices and goals and objectives are inescapably shaped, at least to some degree, by society's current conditions and practices. What I'm describing has always been the case, but I think it's safe to say that rarely, if ever, has the tension between the public university and present conditions been greater than our, in our current moment, when sharply diminished public funding has left the public university in a situation of crisis. Facing this crisis, we must work hard to clarify what the public university should and can be under present conditions. I expect most of you will have assumed a causal relationship between the genesis of this lecture series and the pepper spraying of protesters on our squad on November 18th of last year. You would be correct in this assumption, though the line is perhaps less direct than you might think. Of course, the incident, November 18th, one of the most traumatic and divisive in our institutional history, galvanized our campus community including the offices of the chancellor and provost to address questions of access and affordability with respect to UC Davis in more effective ways than we had done before. November 18th occurred amidst protests not just of tuition hikes, which have been extraordinary over the past few years at UC. Another related concern to use the protesters' vocabulary was the privatization of the university, that is, the privatization of so much of what might be called the public or common wheel. Across our land, there is by and large a decreasing trust in the public sphere and a strong disinclination to invest in government at every level. In California, this is a long-term trend, and in a way, we are now reaping the harvest of, uh, of Proposition 13. For us in the universities, this is an especially bitter harvest. As I spoke with faculty and students last fall and winter, the idea emerged for a series of forums where our campus community could think more deeply about a very broad set of issues related to the public university. I knew that we have many on campus 
who work in this area, many whom we might call on to illuminate the issues historically as well as internationally and comparatively. For universities are also windows where the local can be seen in light of scholarly wisdom and broad knowledge. And they are also set up, as today's event exemplifies, to bring scholars and other speakers from near and far to join in the discussion. It's a firm conviction of mine that this discussion will be strongest and most productive if it includes many voices and many perspectives. I began by discussing universities' dynamically balanced dual allegiance to the past and the present because this helps us to understand the task ahead of us. In collectively deciding the course public universities will take in the years and decades ahead, we must remain mindful of this dual allegiance and take a hard look at the specific terms of the balance. In addressing the future of the public university, we have no more important task and no more difficult challenge than to seek the right balance, one that will allow us to preserve and serve the public university's traditional character and dedication to public service while also responding to the changed conditions of the 21st century. This is, of course, a not easy or uncomplicated task. It is, in fact, a task, task that, despite its real-world practical face, also poses formidable intellectual challenges. This means that responding effectively to our crisis is not just a matter of building consensus regarding what should be done, but also educating ourselves about relevant ideas in history and carefully calculating costs and benefits for different courses of action. Moreover, we must do all of these things in keeping with rigorous, rigorous intellectual standards and with very open minds. I do not imagine that everyone would agree on exactly what that right balance is, for there is no single set of scales that everyone would recognize as the single international standard. Of course, it is precisely in a university where we would expect a debate about the calibration of these scales to flourish and where we must nourish it. Indeed, it is the hope of Professor uh, of Chancellor Katehi, myself, and all who are involved in the Provost Forums that research, teaching, and dialogue in the public university will become an important focus everybody. across the campus and that UC Davis eventually will play a national leadership role in this increasingly important debate. We have high hopes then for this series, but it's important to remember that these forums are only one part and designed to contribute to the larger campus-wide dialogue in the future of the public university. For those who are interested, a page on my website helps to capture that larger dialogue as it announces and archives videos of the major relevant campus events. Now, the reason you've come today. Our first speaker, Michael Burrowoy, is an extraordinary choice to inaugurate our series. We're very lucky to have him here today. I will be stepping on the toes of Martin Kenny, who will be introducing Professor Burroway as soon as I surrender the podium, if I say much more about our speaker. But I will say that in Michael, we have the essential elements for which this series was designed. Widely respected and highly influential scholarship, deep experience and passionate commitment on this topic, and ideas that are guaranteed to challenge our intellect and ideas about how things should be. Personally, I can't think of higher praise that I could give to a colleague. So without further ado, let me yield the podium to Professor Kenny, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Provost Hexter, uh, for helping to fund this uh, public forum, because I think this is going to be a an opportunity for all of us to start to think about what is, what is the university. And I also would like to thank Alicia Thompson who has helped, doing, helped with the organization of this event which has, has been quite a bit of work for her. It's, it's difficult to adequately describe the breadth of Michael's research. Uh, I brought him in when I was a graduate student at Cornell uh, a couple years ago to, to come speak, uh, in this case, about his work on uh, the workplace and on understanding how consent was manufactured in the workplace. He's a world-renowned sociologist and thinker. His books and articles have influenced three generations of social scientists uh, studying work, organization, and institutions. 
His book, Ethnography Unbound, is the classic text on ethnographic research methods. Now, Ryan Galt, one of our uh, young faculty members, used that text when he was doing research on pesticides in pesticide usage in Costa Rica. More recently, Michael has turned his attention to understanding the multifaceted role of the public university as an institution that only, not only produces knowledge and trains people for the labor market, but also has a vital role as a social critic. And I think we sometimes forget how important for society to have a social critic, how important that is for our society, for many societies. Uh, Moreover, as the president of the International Sociological Association, he is uniquely placed to reflect upon the international dimensions of the current crisis of public universities globally. And for those interested in following up on Michael's work, we have posted a number of links on the provost's website. I, I encourage you to go to that. Um, also, we will pass around sign-up sheets so that if we can get your email address next time, we can do a little bit more of a viral uh, campaign to get people to know about this, this series. Finally, uh, we will have uh, time for questions. I'm sure Michael will be more than happy to take questions at the end. And we will have a reception immediately after this. And with, it, with that, I will yield the floor to Michael. Good. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm really honored to be your, I guess, inaugural lecturer on universities in crisis, uh, or universities and public good. I shouldn't anticipate all the other speeches you're going to have. Um, and I'm delighted that so many people are here on a Friday afternoon. It is Friday, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it, it, I, I know uh, Provost Hexter from from Berkeley as a, as, a, as a wonderful dean, had a reputation for being actually so attentive to the departments that he oversaw. He, was, it wasn't one of the, he wasn't the dean of the sociology department, but, um, but anyway, he, he's a, and to, to hear him here talk about universities and to put on this program is really fantastic. And actually, in your speech, you anticipated, in fact, many of the themes that I will, uh, not surprisingly, uh, try to address in the next 40 minutes. Um, and I'd like to thank Martin Kenny, who is the one who's been through, I've been having a dialogue with about uh, what I should be talking about today. And he's given me a few instructions, things I shouldn't talk about, as well as things I should talk about. Uh, <laughs> uh, and actually, I've, I've had a wonderful time. Last night, I learned a lot about this university um, over pizza um, with some faculty and, and Martin. And uh, this morning, the community, it's actually community and regional development, the actual, that's the program, right? Um, so I, it's, a, it's a wonderful multidisciplinary program that I think we all have to move in a multi, at least parts of the university should move in a multidisciplinary direction. And it was just wonderful to hear about the different projects and how people could relate to them. And then after that, I had a fantastic time with the sociology department. And I just want to suggest, I mean, who's here? I mean, how many sociologists are here? Hands up for sociologists. They're all over there on my right, right wingers. Okay, how many? What, how, what about? I mean, other social scientists. Uh, any economists? One economist. Token. <laughs> He's in trouble. He's in real trouble. Uh, very good. Okay, geographers are that social science, right? Geographers. Uh huh. Uh, political scientists. Uh huh. Uh huh. Interesting. So, what about natural scientists? Aha, uh -huh, very good, natural scientists, engineers, people from the ag school who have not stuck up their hands. Okay. <laughs> okay. Who have I missed? Did I miss somebody important? Hmm? Humanists. humanists. Ah, how could I forget the humanists? How many humanists? Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, the great critics of the world. Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. Hmm? School of Education. Uh -huh. We see we've got a token from everywhere. Okay, very good. All right. So anyway, it's good, you know, it's good to know who one's insulting as one goes along. Uh, <laughs> yes. All right. Very good. All right. So um, 
Yeah, so I, I was just going to say, I know it's, it's, it's a digression, but it's a very important one. I had a great experience in the sociology department, I guess this afternoon, lunchtime, and I, it's a wonderful way of actually generating dialogue. Um, five graduate students, I suppose either, either selected, volunteered, or coerced, I'm not sure, <laughs> Five graduate students gave five-minute presentations on their dissertation work, and then I was supposed to respond, and then there was... I thought it was a wonderful way of organizing a colloquium, particularly on a Friday, giving real focus and direction to uh, graduate student work and getting somebody from the outside to respond on his or her feet. Uh, I think that's great because we have to... will be my message. We have to be changing the social sciences. We have to be changing sociology in particular, but social sciences, we have to be redirecting it. And the people who are going to redirect it are going to come from graduate students. And we have to, so this is a wonderful way of being, in a sense, accountable to, attentive to what graduate students are thinking. And for me, it was great. Look, I'm here, I am not a specialist in higher education. Um, I. I travel the world. As Martin said, I'm, uh, I'm now president of the International Sociological Association. I'm on sabbatical this year, and, and so rather than going for Chile for a weekend between teaching, I can now actually spend my time this, this year traveling to different countries. I have actually been doing this since 2006, and wherever I go, I try and inquire about the character of the university, the problems it faces. And I've pretty well covered the world. Um, and... Uh, so that's, that's, I suppose, the, 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 the basis on which I will make some of the comments today. And I think, and that's one of the reasons why I accepted, it was an honor, but I also accepted the invitation, because I think it's very important, very important that we all be thinking and talking about the university in which we live. And I think there has not been sufficient amount of critical discussion about the university, and we have to, if we are going to continue to have a university that's recognizable as such, we have to participate more actively in its direction. And so this sort of forum is absolutely crucial for our future, and will actually build a whole sort of vigorous, I hope, discussion amongst uh, faculty, students, staff, uh, about where we should be going. Now, you have actually asked me to be your first speaker, but every speaker will have a distinctive perspective. And I'm a sociologist, for good or bad, and I actually love sociology. One of my colleagues was trying to insult me from another department and wrote a little article, oh, the boy who loves sociology. <laughs> that was me. Um, <laughs> and I am actually a sociological chauvinist. So you have to I'll, I'll put my claims up front. And the majority, of, I've got the majority of people here perhaps are sociologists, so I'm very lucky to be supported, I hope. Uh, but, <laughs> but actually, it is the case that sociologists don't all agree with one another. That is very true. But anyway, I am going to give you a sociological perspective uh, on universities and universities in crisis. Um, so let me begin by saying what that sociological perspective entails. And I guess this is where I start insulting the economists. Okay. <laughs> economist, economist. And I'm going to watch your face. Okay, I've got my infrared here. Okay. Okay. We'll come back to save our university. But this, of course, was at that's Berkeley about two years ago. And then we no longer hear about saving our university. I don't know why. why. But anyway, well, that's something we will discuss later on. So, all right. That's where... That's where I, as a sociologist, begin with what I call third wave marketization. Other people call neoliberalism. And I get this idea of third wave marketization by starting from a gentleman by the name of Karl Polanyi, The Great Transformation. This is now an, an, uh, sort of a canonical work within economic sociology. Um, and uh, I'm a devotee to the reconstruction of this book, The Great Transformation. Uh, I don't know how many here have read this book, but essentially Karl Polanyi is concerned with the problems of the overextension of the market. It's a book that was written in 1944, 
and Karl Polanyi made the provocative claim that fascism and Stalinism, as well as social democracy and New Deal, were effectively responses to the expansion of the market that begins essentially for him at the end of the 18th century. And that market fundamentalism generates a reaction that can be of a very coercive, regressive, uh, authoritarian uh, character. And he thought that he thought that never again would humanity meddle with market fundamentalism. He thought that we have learned the lesson. We must not mess with market fundamentalism. Well, he was wrong. He was wrong because I don't think he took seriously enough about the dynamics of capitalism and why the dynamics of capitalism generates what I would call waves of marketization. He thought there was one, there was probably two waves in his history. There was a wave in the 19th century starting at the end of the 18th century, and then there was a, a wave in the 20th century um, and that had a reaction generating precisely the New Deal, social democracy on the one side, fascism, Stalinism on the other. And then we find in the 1970s this third wave of marketization. Now he thought, he thought, that if you push marketization too far, inevitably it would threaten society and somehow this thing called society that nobody knows what it is, not even sociologists really know what society is, that's a secret, don't tell anybody, uh, <laughs> that somehow society would react and protect itself. There would be what he calls a counter-movement. And there indeed were counter-movements in the 19th century and indeed in the 20th century. 19th century, it was the local movements, labor movements around factory. I mean, he talked about 19th century England. He talked about factory movements. He talked about the recognition of trade unions. He talked about cooperatives. Um, and he talked about political parties, in a sense, defending the interests of the laboring class that was being the laboring class subject to market, subject to commodification. And then he talked about the way in the 20th century, the expansion of the market generated reactions that were not around local struggles, around state struggles, national struggles, and the ways in which states became to, came to regulate the market. And I think if we're going to talk about a third wave marketization, a third wave marketization, we're going to have to think globally. We're going to have to think globally. Um, but we are in a period where the problems have taken on a global character and the counter-movement has to be of a global character. And we are not in any, there's no guarantee that there will be indeed a counter-movement. Uh, there are small resistances, but whether they will add up to a counter-movement is not clear. And the question is, therefore, whether we are entering, in a sense, a final crisis for the human species. And really, a important question for us to ask, and my argument is the universities have to play a crucial role in understanding this. So, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to give you a little bit more of a little summary of how I contextualize. We cannot understand the university today outside third wave marketization. And Polanyi talks about these fictitious commodities, basically factors of production that when subject to unregulated exchange, lose their use value. And what did he say? First of all, labor. If you commodify labor in an unregulated way, it no longer is able to labor. Secondly, he said, when you commodify land, and then we can extend that to air and water, to nature, you commodify nature in an unregulated manner, then you are going to actually destroy the forms of subsistence existence on this planet. And then he said, if you commodify money, subject monies to arbitrary exchange, then you're going to create such an unstable environment that businesses are going to go out of business, finance capital. And I don't have to tell you that this is prophetic, and much too prophetic, that actually Polanyi never dreamt of the degrees to which labor, or perhaps labor, but definitely not nature and money, not nature and finance, it's a way to the extent to which they could actually be commodified and the dr dramatically problematic consequences they would have. But what he did not talk about was a fourth fictitious commodity, which is education based on knowledge. Based on knowledge. And that is the fourth fictitious commodity. And we know you know, I was thinking this morning about Daniel Bell, Post-Industrial Society, written, I don't know, the 1960s, early 70s, perhaps. Uh, 
you know, talking about the important centrality of knowledge in the post-industrial world and how, in fact, knowledge, as we now know, affects the way that labor is organized. Manuel Castells writes about this in The Information Society. The ways in which knowledge actually, interestingly, gets involved now in the way that nature is commodified or the ways in which, for example, we deal with environmental problems, right? Well, we deal with environmental problems through the market, through the market. Right. Uh, Nicole, where are you? Ah, oh, there you are. I just um, came, Nicole came up to Nicole Bigger came up to me and was talking precisely. What do you say? Front loading. What was the expression you used? You said you talked to somebody in the Department of Energy. Oh yeah, they, they said that um, uh, they believe that their role is to develop devices and knowledge and put it on the loading dock, uh, and the load and the market will pick it up from the loading dock. The market picks it up from the loading dock. When we deal with, well, how do we deal? How do we deal with global warming? How do we do climate change? We deal with it by carbon trading, by their market solutions, market solutions. And that's where the sort of knowledge comes in. Economists, economists are wonderful at inventing all sorts of new sorts of markets, and indeed finance capital knowledge gets involved in very deeply. But what we are not taking into account is that knowledge itself is becoming commodified. And that's what this talk is about next 25 minutes, perhaps 30, <laughs> that the production of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge is becoming subject to market exchange. And that's why we have to think, in my view, about the university and the university in crisis. Now, let me say a little bit generally that I want to impress upon you I want to impress upon you that this university in crisis through the commodification of knowledge and the commodification of its dissemination and indeed the commodification of the certification of knowledge that now you can just buy degrees online. You know, if you can be doing distance learning and you can pay somebody to actually take the exams for you. For five thousand dollars, you can now get a degree. That, you know that goes along. Yeah, you know about this? Okay, very good. I'm glad your administrators know about this. Yes. So anyway, we are in the business. We're in the business. We're in the business of the university subject to budget crisis, which is none other than the commodification of knowledge. Now, this is a very uneven. Well, as yes, as Leon Trotsky would say, it is a combined and uneven process. It is a combined, and I was last week in Bowdoin College, you know, Liberal Arts College. You know, you wouldn't know there was a crisis there. You just wouldn't know. Well-endowed, relatively well-heeled students, some with scholarships, uh, 1,800 students, faculty teach two courses a semester, expected, of course, to publish two. When they're replaced, they're replaced not by lecturers with very low salaries, but by people, lecturers, with exactly the same conditions of work as normal faculty. There, this is a bubble. This is a bubble. But, you know, we must recognize it as a bubble. And when we must recognize that Harvard has got a $36 billion endowment, you know, it makes a difference. Okay, so one of the points I'm going to be insisting on making is the hierarchization of higher education in this country and in other countries. I was the week before at San Jose State. Uh-huh. San Jose State, where you have eight faculty, uh, teaching eight courses each a year, and uh, with about, in the sociology department, 600 majors, right? And no help from GSIs, no help from graduate students, no, no, no. Okay, and a lot, a whole army of lecturers. A very different situation from Bowdoin College. So there is this real hierarchization going on, polarization, I would say, within, within higher education. And of course, at the same time, what is happening at San Jose State? Students can't get into courses because, of course, there is the contraction, the contraction of entry into UC system and into the state system. Uh, falling off of entry because that's the way that universities respond to the budget cuts. So, all right. But then we could go on to other countries. Before that, I was in Latin America. Interesting stories there. 
So, for example, in Chile, very interesting story. There, too, you have the commodification of higher education, increased student fees. There's protests there because in Chile, students don't work. Or they say about 10% of students work. Who pays for student fees? Family, parents, kin. So, in a sense, everybody is implicated in the loans and the debts of students. And this is a debt society. And so that is why you get this amazing protest in Chile. Whereas in this country, students will protest. But it really doesn't go very far. Because in this country, students are expected to work and then pay their loans. We take a loan out, you expect to pay it. Yeah, well, that's got to change. If I were to make any sort of political program here, I would suggest that we, uh, that, you know, that the 40 million people who have uh, student loans in this country average about 20, 23 and a half thousand uh, each person default. There should be collect. If the banks can threaten to, def to, 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 to bring the homes down on the economy, then 40 million people, that would be a great social movement. But that would change, require a certain change in mentality. Anyway, I, this is not a political uh, speech. <laughs> so, all right, anyway, the point is that in Latin, so that's, that's Chile, but then you go to Argentina. Fascinating story, the Cordoba Revolution of 1917 generated the peculiar system there where, listen to this, open admissions, no fees. Public universities with very few private ones and democratic election of administrators. Whew. Would you survive that, Ralph Hexter? <laughs> okay, but let's say this immediately, it does not secure great education. I mean, you know, if there's 200,000 people at the University of Buenos Aires, and that's that problematic education. But anyway, that's a different, a different context. And if you look at Latin America, generally Brazil is where it's happening. It dominates in higher education as in so much else. The entire continent. You can go to Africa. About three or four weeks ago, I was in the University of Zambia. Forty years since I've been there. That's where I got my degree in sociology. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's diminutive compared with what it was in those days. It was sort of an elite university now, 10, 000, then about 1,000 now. The same space holds 10,000 students. Faculty, essentially, are not paid a living wage. They have to have multiple jobs. The best faculty leave for mode two type knowledge, i.e. knowledge outside the university, or they go abroad. Um, so basically, we have a university that is subject to intense degradation. It becomes more like a vocational school. And then on top of it, the students who graduate can't get a job. Universities in Africa are, in a sense, hardly exist as such. Except in South Africa, which is, again, like Brazil, dominates the continent. The legacy of apartheid generates a quite a broad uh, university system, incredibly polarized between the old white universities and the old black colleges. And there's increasing divide, though, of course, the new, the elite white universities now taking large numbers of African students and are relatively well funded. But there is this enormous polarization within that system. And I could go on. I suppose I should mention Europe. <laughs> Why not, after all? Europe. You know, there's another interesting project in Europe. Take Britain, Uni uh, United Kingdom. There they introduced under Thatcher. She couldn't commodify higher education, so basically she wanted to regulate it. So how do you regulate? You introduce an evaluation system. They call the research assessment exercise, and where all faculties, the productivity is evaluated every four years, summed up, so a department has a certain standing, evaluated along certain criteria, and so they're strong on, they either have a one, two, three, four, five rating. And if they have a five rating, then they get a lot of money. If they get one, they get zero. And so essentially then, basically what happens is that these departments um, engage in a competitive struggle. They spend a year out of every five years trying to game the system so that they can boost their productivity imagination image. Now they introduced impact. And now they've also introduced a moment of, of teaching too. So, you know, University of Manchester imports Stiglitz, you know, because it will then for three weeks, a lot of money, but, you know, boosts boost the ranking of Manchester University. So that's the sort of strategy. I mean, it's really interesting. When you look at that system, I was really astonished because it reminded me 
of my work in the Soviet Union. Basically, you know, Thatcher introduces, them, uh, uh, introduces the evaluation system, but essentially, it's really sort of so Soviet-type planning. Basically, you know, the, basically you evaluate. You can't use market criteria, so you create your own criteria for impact, uh, for productivity. And so I thought, well, I thought my career as a Sovietologist was all over when the Soviet Union collapsed. I rediscovered it in Great Britain, right. But of course, the danger is that that ranking system, that whole rating system, is now being used actually to most effectively commodify higher education. We know what has happened. The high fees have shot up to 10,000 pounds a year uh, at, from, from virtually zero in a period of about 10 years. And what has happened is that essentially certain departments are now targeted for closure on the basis of how their evaluations uh, come out. So, yes, yeah, so, the, so that, that rationalization becomes the vehicle for deepening uh, commodification. Okay. Well, you know, there are exceptions to this rule. And we were, Martin and I were talking about, you were talking about this morning. China pours money into higher education. India, increasingly, the last few years. Brazil, Taiwan. Anywhere else? Turkey? Turkey Iran. Iran? Iran mess? I don't know about Iran. Turkey? Turkey? It's interesting. Turkey, of course, got lots of private. You know, they try and build the Harvard on, uh, 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 in the Koch University. With, so, so many, many countries actually get these multi-millionaires to actually create their own universities in their own name. Yes, Turkey's a very interesting complex. They're all interesting complex stories. Singapore, very good. Yes, indeed, Singapore. Singapore, two or three really great, well-heeled. And, of course, if you go about the Middle East, the Middle East is a very interesting story because, on the one hand, if you go to Lebanon, you have huge sort of national universities, but then you have the American University of Beirut, which is a sort of, again, very healed sort of enclave within the higher education. Same thing in Egypt. You know, 200,000 students at Cairo University, but I don't know how many at the American University of Cairo, probably be of the order of two or 3,000. Um, and, of course, the fees re reflect that. Um, so, yes. So that, but then, of course, you also have the Emirates, right? New York, you know, NYU has its sort of outposts. As we all be having our outposts in Abu Dhabi or who, wherever. Funded, so funded public relations for, for relatively authoritarian regimes. All right, no, no politics here. Okay. All right, that gives you a sense. I want to really stress that this is a complex story. It's really complex. So it's a combined and even. I didn't even mention the sort of post Soviet story. And that is that the legacy of the Soviet Union is very strong because the universities in the Soviet Union didn't have a huge amount of autonomy. And that continues in the post Soviet era. Okay, all right. Let me. Move on, because I should indeed. Universities in crisis. All right, now let's talk about what these crises are. Notice what I've got here. I see smiles. I see smiles because this is it. This is the trademark of the sociologist. A two-by-two two table. No, <laughs> no, no self-respecting sociologist can manage a career without their own branded two-by-two. Two. And, there's a, and in the context of universities, Robert Merton, Talcott Parsons, um, and well, he's not really sociologist, but Ernest Boyer all had their two-by-two two tables around the university and its functions in order to address the particular issues of their time. They presented their two-by-two two tables as universal, as I will present mine, but they're actually addressing particular problems. So let's talk about... Budgetary crises. What leads to budgetary crisis? Well, you want to hang on to, as Martin reminded me last night, do your federal money. Not all universities can hang on to it. But, you know, if you're doing research of high caliber in the right area, you can hang on to federal money. You can get some money from patents, but research suggests there's not a lot of money in patents, and it tends to be concentrated in certain areas like the biosciences. And you want to look for donors. I mean, I assume that uh, Provost Hexton spends a lot of time trying to get money from donors. <laughs> no comment, no comment. Okay. More the chancellor. And the oh, you're out? Oh, that's interesting. You spend it. 
Good to know. Did you hear that? He spends it. All right. Fees, that's another way to deal with it. You know, increase fees and restrict intake. So you don't have to spend so much money teaching, right? Intensification of teaching. More teaching, though it's very interesting that, you know, at the University of California systems, those who are in tenure-trap positions don't seem to be doing any more teaching. My colleagues actually decided themselves, just like that, to do less teaching. I mean, in this era, amazing. And who takes up the slack? Lecturers. This is the outsourcing. And then, of course, there are proposals for de-skilling. This de-skilling through distance learning doesn't always turn out uh, to be as profitable as perhaps was un originally understood. And then, of course, there's diversification. You know, there's athletics. You know, perhaps you get some money through the public relations of athletics. In, in, in Russia, in Russia, they'll do anything to get money to universities. They're a profit center. So if it's more profitable to actually rent out your premises, rent out your premises, okay? That's another idea you may have. Okay. <laughs> and the result is of all this is deep, deep polarization. Polarization between, I'll talk about in a minute, countries, but deep polarization within countries. I mean, Harvard is not San Jose, and the gap between them is, is widening, but it's happening polarization within universities, between, I don't know, the ag school and the poor sociologists. Uh, Ah, no smile from over there. Okay, but you know, it's, it's, it's between engineer and between, and it's interesting because, as, as Chris Newfield um, has, has shown, that it basically it is the humanities, yes, the humanities and the social sciences who do so much of the teaching that in a sense subsidize the engineering schools uh, uh, and the ag econ schools, and so in a sense, the cheap research that universities provide for say, pharmaceutical companies, is actually ultimately the result of the fact that the social science humanities do so much teaching because the money from student fees and the actual, what little comes from the state is based on a per-student basis so that we are, in a sense, supporting it. Though we, of course, are subordinated very often to those more powerful entities. Yes. All right, we'll move on, move on. So... I think this leads to a governance crisis because insofar as we become more and more like a corporation concerned with trying to counteract the budget crisis, we actually develop whole new structures of administration. And interesting enough, Terry Sullivan, well-known sociologist, found herself fighting, you know, the Board of Visitors at University of Virginia. And this was precisely a struggle over to what extent the university should indeed be corporatized, to what extent new strategies of teaching, of saving money, of drawing money in should be developed. So there are struggles, and that's epitomizes that there are struggles around the character of governance, around corporatization. Then what also happens as a result of the budgetary crisis, you know, those who are want to invest in the universities have to know whether it's worth investing. So you develop ranking systems. Funnily enough, the Shanghai ranking system developed in China was designed to actually try and to, to, to evaluate Chinese universities against the best American universities, i.e. supposedly the best in the world, i.e., you know, the Ivy Leagues, all right? So what they do is they generate a wonderful ranking system, which is basically designed to incentivize Chinese universities in particular, but now it is used all over the world so that different countries will pour resources into perhaps one or two universities so that they become world-class universities and can be ranked in the top 500. And this has all sorts of current consequences for particularly humanities and social sciences, drawing people out of local problems, national problems, and orienting them to problems that are defined in the United States of America or in Europe. And also getting people to write in English, if it's in the social sciences and the humanities. So in a sense, you're drawing people out from the very problems universities are supposed to be set up. Ranking systems. Yes. 
Standardization. Well, I talked about Britain. You, talk, you can also talk about Europe. The Bolognianization is a process of standardization. And from the standpoint, for example, of German universities, this involves a degradation of the university. And there is indeed a struggle there to what extent Bolognianization in Spain, in Portugal, in Germany should be introduced. Yes. And overall, the governance crisis is all about audit culture. To what extent shall we be controlled, in a sense, dictated by ranking systems that we don't control, that are beyond our control, and to what extent um, are, is there going to be new forms of governance within the university? And so I think we are facing something of a governance. We only have an identity crisis, because faced with these changes, we have to ask, and that's what we are here to do today, what is, what is the university today? Is it to be increasingly look like a corporation, as which some people argue, or should indeed it be more like the old idea of a collegial organization in which faculty, to, and to some extent uh, other interest groups in the university, but mainly faculty and administrators, administer the university in their own imagination, um, the, with a view to sustaining autonomy. So, one way then is to recall the past, save our university, go back to the ideals of Clark Kerr. I mean, he was the devil incarnate in 64. Now he's our great redeemer. <laughs> uh, he is the architecture of the master plan. I mean, it's out the window. It is utopian. We cannot recall that situation, amazingly. So, we are in a sense of fearing a dystopian future. Fearing a dystopian future. And we are divided increasingly, increasingly, as a result of the budgetary and governance crisis, we are increasingly divided and fragmented as we become hierarchized. So, again, discussions that transcend disciplines and schools are very important if we want to, in a sense, rediscover the meaning of the university, which I think should revolve around this fourth issue, a legitimation crisis, which Provost Hexter referred to, namely, the credibility of the idea of a public university today. And that is under assault. As soon as you start saying the university is a private good, that students have to pay fees, then the public idea of the university loses, loses its credibility. So what do you do? Well, now you have social scientists saying, oh, and humanities saying, oh, how valuable is the degree? How valuable is the research? I was looking at a report done by my colleague, Mike Hout, uh, basically arguing, well, if uh, each student brings to California four, no, one dollar turns into four dollars if you invest in university education. And he argues that, you know, there is enormous increase in returns for individual students to get degrees. He didn't say if they have a job or not. Um, but the point is that we are now uh, accepting the rhetoric of trying to show how valuable and worth we are and how important the humanities is for developing what citizens of this country. Yeah, so we are put on the back foot as a defensive position. And we talk about public service and service learning. And I think we should be much more involved in what I would call public education. And we have the media, social media, to do this. So we can talk about how, indeed, um, faculty now have their lectures broadcast, you know, in the, what's it called, the Coursera, for the, there are many of them. There are, there, but the point is, I think we should be more self-consciously using the social media to engage in public education. We should not be thinking just as the students in our classes as the recipients, but much more broadly, we have to have a new vision of the word public in public university. Not just the idea of accessibility to university education, but accountability to publics. We should be much more engaged in that dialogue. Okay, so, those are my four crises. And I think to each crisis, there is a corresponding function of the university that we have to pay attention to. And so, the budgetary crisis, I think we have to think about the place of what I call policy 
science, policy, research. Um, that is science research geared towards specific clients that indeed will bring in cash. And we should not be just accepting the problems as defined by clients, but we should be in the principle in the business of advocating policies. Yes. Yes. Second, the governance crisis requires that we sustain somehow a professional community that is accountable to itself. Not self-referential, but at least has autonomy to evaluate its own products and not be subject to what I regard in many contexts as extraneous criteria. And third, we have to respond to a legitimation crisis with, as I was saying, with a public engagement, a much deeper public engagement than we have been engaged in so far. And this has all to take place in response to our identity crisis, namely a community of critical engagement. We should be engaged precisely in discourse, discussions, as is being promoted by Provost Hexter. And so these are the projects. We have to, in a sense, we have to sustain the professional policy and public and critical in an interrelationship. Now, these functions, I can't go into it now, but these functions are essential, interdependent, and antagonistic. That's the problem. You know, so far as we are professionally engaged and, in a sense, accountable to the community of professionals, so, in a sense, we can't be, at the same time, publicly engaged, because being publicly engaged means to produce what? It means to produce and engage in a dialogue that is accessible to publics. Now, believe me, the American Sociological Review, just to take a random example, is not accessible to publics, but it's pure science. In fact, it's not accessible to most sociologists, but neither here nor there. The point is that there is this real tension between the professional and the public, and yet there is also interdependence. Because I don't think you can have a vibrant professional world without some input, particularly in the social sciences and humanities, obviously I'm talking about, without an input from the public, and vice versa. There is no public engagement, there is no public economics, there is no public political science, there's no public anthropology unless there is the equivalent professional development. We have something to offer to publics. Yes. So... And, of course, the relation between critical and professional. You know, the professional doesn't like to be criticized, but we have to engage in that critique, and that critique should be of an interdisciplinary character. So I could go on, but let me say that I think these are four essential functions of the university, and they are interdependent and antagonistic. The problem is this. The problem is this, is that we can translate that two-by-two two table into four models of the university. And the danger is that one or two will dominate. There is the regulatory model. We've talked about the ways in which increasingly universities are subject to ranking systems in a sense of their own making, but then come to haunt them. And that this regulatory system creates a world system of higher education that subjects those who are outside the North to actually criteria that are, in a sense, detaching the universities from the wider community. Very problematic, but it also is affecting... Everybody now talks about rankings, except at Harvard or Princeton or Yale. <laughs> but, you know, everybody is caught into the business of rankings of one form or another. And as I say, the most extreme, in my view, is, 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 in, is in the United Kingdom, where, they, where this system has really, in my view, destroyed higher education. Yes, and then there is the market model. And the market model is basically market solve all problems. And, well, it's actually, you know, it's hard work to disprove this. I mean, to be quite rigorous about it, it's actually hard work to disprove it. But, and there are books, for example, Philip Morofsky, 
who wrote a book precisely on this question, a very thick economist, um, writes, it shows exactly the consequences of the market model. For example, the consequences, and, 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 and Martin has written about this too, the relationship between, for example, universities and pharmaceutical companies, and how collusive that relationship is, and how erosive it can be of academic work. There are, there are studies that show, indeed, that markets can actually lead to um, a distortion of what we understand to be uh, the university. Um, the market, I think, um, and the ranking systems, too, they tend, I think this is really problematic, they tend to reduce time horizons, make them smaller and smaller. And so if you go, for example, to, you're interested in what, how to survive tomorrow in terms of monetary, how, you get, how do you get a grant? You get a grant, and then before you've actually delivered on the grant, you're being evaluated as to how much you deliver, and you have to produce the next proposal for the next grant. But everything becomes short-term horizons and very much focused on individual projects. So the problem is no long-term thinking, and we need long-term thinking of a world of subject to third-wave mar third marketization. So that's the market model. Then there is what I call the model, and this is the counter model, this is the reflexive dimension, the critical engagement, the importance of seeing the university as an arena of critical engagement, critical discourse. And we have great potentiality for doing that in this country, at least in some of the public universities as they exist. You know, Michel Foucault used to come to Berkeley on a regular basis. Some of you may know that in the 1980s. Now, everybody thought he was interested in the bathhouses in San Francisco. But actually, in an interview he did, very interesting, with the Daily Cow, he said that he loves the American University, in this case Berkeley, because it is itself a micro-public sphere. That he felt that this was a rumor of amazing public engagement and discourse, so impossible in the universities in France where, of course, you have a national public sphere dominated by one or two intellectuals, um, but nevertheless, you, have a, you do have a public sphere in a national... But in the, the advantage, uh, he says, and why he liked to go to Berkeley, is because it was already a potential arena for public debate. Well, he was, of course, Michel Foucault, so wherever he went, there was public debate. Um, but nevertheless, there's an interesting idea there that the university has an arena of critical engagement. And finally, there is the model of deliberative democracy. We have to think about the university as much more centrally engaged in the world around. As Provost Hexter was saying, that what we, we are living in a world in which the, universe, the membrane separating the university from wider society is becoming thinner and thinner and thinner. And we are really increasingly, because we're in third wave marketization, because of these crises, the regulatory and the market ones, we are actually subject to forces beyond the university. And we can retry and retreat. But that is not going to solve the problem. We have to advance. We have to produce alternative visions of the university, engage with publics in new ways, much more adventurous ways. And it's particularly opportune, I think, in moments when the new generation of students seems to be increasingly skeptical of, well, the new generation of active students, increasingly skeptical of liberal democracy, the state. In fact, the world has become increasingly skeptical of the capacity of states and of liberal democracy to actually contain what I'm calling third wave marketization. And therefore, we have to think of alternative institutions to well, fill the gap. And I think the university, the university is so central. And this was, of course, what Daniel Bell said. The university is so central to actually this third wave marketization that it can actually be, play a much more significant role. But the problem is this. And the problem is this. <laughs> and the question is, and the question is whether in fact we can actually begin to have conversations among ourselves that take this into account and at the same time build new types of relationships with communities beyond the academy. 
And if we don't, the university is not going to be recognizable as such. I am not saying get rid of regulation. I am not saying get rid of market models. What we need all four. We cannot be in the world of dogmatism. We have to rescue this reflexive dimension of critical engagement and, as we want in the most sort of ambitious form, deliberative democracy with organizations outside. So I think there is, in a sense, a third wave marketization. Knowledge is quite central to that. It itself is being commodified. And in the Polanyan analysis, to return to the very beginning, in the Polanyan analysis, the question is whether there will be a counter-movement. Now, we can, in a sense, resist. And there is resistance all the time. Resistance in the form of social movements. Resistance in the form of, well, let's fight for Proposition 30. Resistance in the form of, well, perhaps we can be innovative here and perhaps we can make some money by having a uh, satellite campus in Abu Dhabi. There are all these short-term there are short-term solutions, but I want to suggest to you we need a long-term vision because I think the university is at the core, is at the center of finding a counter-movement to third-wave marketization more generally. And that is, means that university, in a sense, not to put it in too uh, dramatic fashion, is actually at the core of the, f of the fate of the human species because we are at the center of this third-wave marketization, whether we like it or not. And of course, some of our colleagues are actually think that third wave marketization is where we should be going. But I'm trying to convince you, of course, that third wave marketization is, like Polanyi, is actually destructive of the world around us. And so I'm pushing for a bigger vision of what the university can be. So thank you for inviting me to give this talk. So, so Michael, open the okay. Up. There are some, there are some see microphones uh, uh. if they're needed, but if they're not, perhaps you can say who you are. Uh, yeah, I'm Subhash Rizbeg. I'm a director of our internship and career center. Uh huh. Sorry. Uh, so uh, many years ago, when I was a graduate student actually at Berkeley, I read a uh, sociologist uh, by the name of Toffler, I think it was, Alvin Toffler. Am I accurate in saying that? Yeah. And he Well, had... we don't all embrace him as a sociologist, but that's, that'll do for now. <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm an illiterate engineer talking right. about sociology. So, uh, But I recall him saying that the speed of change in society would be such that people would be unable to cope with it. It's sort of the general message I recall from that book. Is some of what you said today um, kind of reflective of that prediction? Yep, yep. If I may say, I may replace Toffler with a fellow called Zygmunt Bauman, who ah. writes about, who was a very famous sociologist, mm -hmm. uh, recognizable also, uh, Polish originally, but he writes about liquid modernity. Oh. And uh, he, writes about, he writes about a book every six months on liquid something, liquid love, liquid <laughs> life. I mean, everything is liquid. Um, and he basically essentially is saying that we, he used to talk about postmodernity. This, this is the contemporary world in which we live, in which the old solidities of industrial capitalism, if you will, have disappeared. And there is this radical uncertainty and insecurity that is essential to life he claims all over the planet. Um, and I think that, I think that there is truth to that. Um, but that is all the more, he offers no solution, but that is all the more reason why we should be believing in, I believe in a solid sociology to address a liquid world. We need solid universities. We need to be actually recognizing that we need to, for in this case, bringing these four functions together. Yes, I think that is right. And the question is, can we contest this? This mm. is another way of talking about third wave marketization, liquid modernity, or what Toffler says, yes. So uh, when you said divisions, would it help our cause to think in the future of the university to 
sort of go undivided and, and synthesize disciplines together? Well, yes. I mean, well, not, not, not necessarily synthesize disciplines. Disciplines have their own character, but there should be cross-disciplinary talk, mm -hmm. cross-school talk. Sure. You know, there shouldn't be two cultures. I mean, when I come here and talk, you know, there should be a few more engineers. How about that? I mean, you know, uh, or bring, I mean, what would be, of course, important is to bring an engineer to talk about this issue, mm -hmm. right? So, yes, so I'm, yes, the, I don't, I'm not, I'm actually a believer in disciplines, but we cannot not talk to one another. That's the crucial thing. And uh, the world is very balkanized. And, there are many reasons why we don't talk to one another, but at least analyzing and reflecting upon them and having th events like this on Friday afternoons may be the way to actually begin to bridge disciplines. But that's a struggle, huge struggle, particularly in northern countries. It's less so in the global south. Yes. Thank you. Nicole. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, uh, I'm uh, Nicole Biggert. I'm a sociologist. I'm a management professor, and I'm director of the Energy Efficiency Center, which is primarily composed of engineers. So I, I live in a very material world um, much of the time. Um, one of the things that um, I'm studying with uh, uh, Dina Biscotti, sociologist over there, uh, is uh, the role of religious organizations uh, who are who are um, quite amazingly joining in interfaith ways to, to develop um, both ideas, ideologies, as well as practices around uh, stewarding the earth um, um, by swapping out light bulbs and doing many other very practical things, but interpreting them as uh, in, in ideological uh, ways. One of the things that um, I think if you look at the, the world, we have seen the as you said, the contraction in many ways of the, uh, of the solidity of the university, but we have seen incredible globally the, 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 the rise of, of religious institutions of, of all forms as, as playing a, a larger and larger role. And we have a very secular society, but that's not true in, in many places. And I wonder if you would talk about the rise of religion, um, uh, religious institutions, as you've traveled around um, around the globe, and what role you you know you see that playing? Is it you know we st university started as religious uh, mm. institutions? Mm. Mm. Oh, I love the <laughs> interesting. Always ask a sociologist about religion. You get mm, <laughs> mm. yeah. I mean, as I. In, 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 in my vision of this third wave marketization, in my Polanyi-esque lens, you know, the rise of Islam can be seen precisely as a response to marketization. And I mean, the, uh, the story in Egypt is a very interesting one because I think apart from everything else going on, one of the reasons why Tahrir Square became Tahrir Square when it did was because of marketization. And of course, this actually galvanized a long tradition in the Brazilian motherhood of Islam. And you know, we see how it is happening in, not just in, in Egypt, but in many other countries. And so I think that, that the rise of Islam is indeed in some way, and of course it's to be worked out exactly how, but in some ways responses to this third wave marketization. Um, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, of course, is, is, is another case in point and has a long history of actually, in Latin America, of, of protesting against the egregious forms of structural adjustment. So I, I think that, I think we have to discuss religion much more seriously. I, what, what, what that mm, mm is, how do I think about the relation between religion and the university? Well, the, the, I think that in, certainly in some countries, uh, uh, um, universities are seen as, uh, as a, um, as a, you know, carrier of Western ideas, of market ideas, of, you know, and uh, universities are seen as, uh, as, uh, as bad guys. And, um, you know, that is part of uh, the identity issue, the right. legitimation issue right. that you're talking right. about. Right, right, right. No, absolutely. Yes, absolutely, yeah. So, Dave Campbell, I was the polit one political scientist in the room who raised my hand, so I'll, I'll ask a question about politics. So, a year ago, we were in Occupy movement and energy around that and, and the other kind of protests that led to the pepper spray and all of that. Uh, 
And today, uh, I was just came from a meeting where we were talking about you know the campus effort to get people uh, organized around Prop 30, and get, getting that passed. So kind of a short term, in your terminology, sort of uh, gap uh, effort. But important. Yeah, important in, in what it does. My question is really about the longer term project here and how we actually can use university settings as incubators of the kind of broader kind of movement and how you get people beyond the sort of you know division that pits student interest against faculty or administration or whatever and to see kind of common cause in this work of you know, confronting the type of society we have and, and this commodification process that you described so eloquently. So just your thoughts on the, the political side of how we begin to make that happen. Whew. I thought you were going to answer that question. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, yes. You know what we could do? Proposal. What are you looking out there for? <laughs> Ah, the proposal. You know, one thing we know, we're in budgetary crisis. You know, one thing we know nothing about is the university budget. It's amazing. I don't know, Provost Hexter may have ill insights into this, but it, it, at Berkeley, we have great difficulty figuring out what on earth the university budget is all about, what's in it, what's not in it, how it's calculated, and so on. You know, in, in Latin America, they have a project. Porto Alegre is the famous one, participatory budgeting. Participatory budgeting. Now, if we were, in a sense, able to see the budget and participate in making decisions about the budget, we would, across disciplines, engage in a very interesting discourse. The whole university may blow up because, of course, <laughs> there are a lot of, you know, if you want to do something radical, it's always dangerous. But, you know, because there are real, real differences. But if we have a sense that the university, as we commonly understand it, is at stake, then a public discussion about budget will be very, very interesting to pursue. So if they can do it in Porto Alegre, yes, they had a PT, a workers' party, but no, you know, if they can do it, you know, we're, you know, if they, then in fact, in principle, we could be having a discussion about budgets, priority budgets. Each department would have an input on about its priorities, would they? Will be aggregated at the level. Oh, you're writing this down, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> They could be aggregated at the level of, you know, the social sciences, the humanities, you know. And then, you know, they're, they're all, you know, you just have to read the story of Porto Alegre. And um, now, how replicable it is and what the adjustment will be. Anyway, you, get, you ask me for an example, and that's my example, okay. That would generate public debate and discussion because something will be a state. Now, you could just do it at the departmental level. And they tried that in, 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 in Argentina, in the University of Rosario. And, you know... It, it, they had, the, but basically there was not a huge amount at stake, so they were, they were really sort of discussing things at the margins. And many of these participatory budgets are actually operating at the margins. A large chunk of the budget is actually kept aside, and only a small chunk is actually subject to public deliberation. But anyway, that would be a beginning. It would be a beginning because it would force us to discuss what we're going to do with our money, what little money we have, and how we might get more money, and how we would distribute it, and what grounds we would distribute it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. <laughs> There's my real utopia. Uh, I'm really curious about the, uh, what you proposed as uh, the public to become sort of a, uh, a solution. Could you talk a little bit more about that? It's public engagement. Yes. Yeah. Well, we do talk a lot about it in the university, about public service and service learning that became a big thing in the 90s. And I'm just trying to sort of, in a sense, deepen that and to have, a, and, and there is a lot, there is a huge amount, but, you know, and of course there is a lot of discourse with people who have money and are powerful. I'm suggesting that there be much more of an embeddedness in civil society and we can perform a public function. I mean, it is amazing, these universities, I mean, I don't know, it would be an interesting thing to calculate uh, how much time any given room on a university of California, Davis, how much time any given room is, is actually, the room is occupied. I mean, it's incredible waste of space. I mean, 
So, and, and so it, there, are, there are ways in which we could, not we just go out to the public, but the public could come in. I mean, and we could perform it. All right, we're all overworked and we're trying to publish in the major journals. But you know, if we really think it's important, we will do this. We will do this. So I think that's, you know, that's just another idea. But basically, we could also on social media. We you know faculty, some faculty just love to be celebrities. <laughs> and so, you know, that's another way. With, with social media today, we can actually... Do you want to respond to that? I was going to ask more about, do you see that interaction somehow defeating some of these other forces? Ah, yeah, yeah, of course. There is there tension here. We have, you know, 24 hours a day. That's the first tension. And indeed, engaging with publics for some is, in a sense, a degradation of the very scientific and scholastic character of the work we do that should be inaccessible to publics. Well, tension. Well, of course, we live on tensions. I want to stress there are real tensions here. But it's a matter of negotiating and rearticulating them. Okay. Yes. Provost Hexter's on top of this. Oh. Here are the uh, utilization figures. <laughs> oh, wow. Percent course enrollments of maximum. He's got utilization figures here. Is that? Very good. <laughs> okay, I will put, you should put this up on your uh, website. But anyway, I mean, so what, do, what does it add up to? What does it, what, this room, for example, how often is it used? All right, but what, I mean, a lot. And because, anyway, all right, yeah, I, 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 that's great. You've got the figures. Transparency, yes. Hi, uh, thank you, Michael. I really appreciate your talk. I'm Jonathan London in Community Regional Development yeah. at the Center for Regional Change. And I'm uh, appreciating how oppressive that um, slide is now, the market <laughs> mode of just uh, taking over. And I really want to excavate um, that critical engagement that, that's been overwhelmed you know, in, in that image and as you describe the, the current moment. Um, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, what some of those practices are. And I read and been inspired by your public sociology uh, uh, lecture at the ASA and so on. Um, so what, what, the, what those sort of critical engagements might look like. And before I let you do that, to give a brief entrepreneurial plug for a, an event that we'll be having as part of this series on the, the critically engaged university. Um, and that will be happening on March 7th um, in 2013, and we'll make sure everyone knows about that. What's uh, that? What's the critically engaged university? Yeah. What, well, come on, tell me. Wow. What is it? Well, we're, we're, we're exploring that. Uh, uh -huh. We're exploring that now. And I'd uh -huh. love to maybe you can even kick off some of those ideas. What, what would that look like? Well, we've been talking, and the critical engagement is basically the academics talking among themselves about what the university should and could be, which is, you know, how Provost Hexter actually introduced the series, right? And, and I think this has to be, in a sense, transdisciplinary. I mean, it's no point in just a uh, tenth of the university having this discussion. It has to be the whole university. And that's the, that's the, how to get the whole university involved. That's why I thought participatory budgeting might be a nice way. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 and, and actually, well, I, at Berkeley, actually, there, there, is, there is a sort of listserv, and people do engage, but it's a, such a small number of people who are involved in this. So the question is, how can we expand that? How can we engage, develop a discussion among ourselves in which we feel interested to participate? So we, that people have got to have some sort of reason to participate other than, you know, because... Well, I, it's difficult to generalize, but if we talk a place like UC Davis or Berkeley, people, you know, faculty are not doing too badly. As I said, you know, we just lowered our teaching. Well, I shouldn't say this, but I just lowered our teaching. I mean, what's going on? So faculty, so basically there is the, the, the people who have a long-term stake and would lead perhaps this discussion are actually not too worried. I mean, they talk about them being worried. They're not really that worried. Um, so it's, uh, it's other places that have fewer resources. I guess I'm wondering maybe the, to, to spur that kind of uh, urgency to, to what it might look like for those critical conversations amongst faculty to be also with br the broader public right. and kind of get a sense of those struggles, those everyday kinds of practices of, uh, you know, of the oppressiveness of the market and so on, that that, that might stir things up out of our comfort zone. Uh, that well, we, or the uh, environment. Isn't that, isn't that a great, great? You know, it has to bring in different disciplines. 
and it brings in the engineers, the chemists, you know, it brings everybody in. And it's an issue that we can potentially transmit to publics beyond the university. I mean, so I think after that, sometimes perhaps the way to take something issue specific. I always think, you know, as I'm talking as a sociologist, you know, the great moments of public sociology are the moments of crisis. I always thought if I were president, I wasn't, I was president of the, of, of the ASA before then, but if I'm being president of the ASA when Katrina hit, my imagination was I would give all the 55 or however many uh, sections there are in the ASA, I'd give them $2,000 each, somewhere, money from somewhere. It's not 100,000, we can afford it in the ASA. So, and they would produce a report in three weeks about their particular perspective on Katrina. Just at the moment when public attention is riveted to this issue. So we have to exploit rapidly crises in society that we can then transmit our vision of what this may mean for us and for ourselves. Right? It's, uh, but you know, we're always years behind. <laughs> I mean, I have to wait. You know, I remember I was, I was very interested in what was happening. I was watching it every day. Solidarity movement, 1980-81 in Poland. And you know, I wonder, so I was packing my bags, packing my bags, waiting for me my, for my academic leave, right? And so by the time you know academic leave begins in January, but December 13th, there's a coup. I mean, basically, Darazelsky takes power, and I've, it's all gone. I mean, so, you know, we, we have to, I know, we live in a liquid world. We have to also be perhaps a little bit more flexible. But anyway, these are, no, this all sounds impossible, I know. It all sounds impossible, but that's the way we have to be thinking. At least thinking. Yeah. Return to the issue of uh, religion that Nicole uh -huh. brought up. Uh, I was reading somewhere, I guess, Christopher Hitchin, the Dawkins, and someone saying that, well, good people do good things in the world and bad people do bad things, but for good people to do bad things, that takes religion. Uh, so. Whoa. <laughs> I, I've always tried to interpret what that meant. Uh, and so in the context of university community, what should the role of university f communities be in, in a religious sense, especially in the sense of professors transmitting unconscious messages about religion to your students, your graduate students, postdocs, and so on? Hmm. 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 Interesting. Well, you know, it all depends what you mean by religion. But I think sociology is religion, and for example. So, and you know, basically sociology has a set of values that I think broadly sociologists share. Freedom, equality, and I think they support the foundations of all that we do. And they should be made explicit, because they do indeed. And there are different ways in which they can be actualized. And, you know, in my discipline, we have a Marx, a Weber, and a Dirk, and they do it in different ways. But they all, you know, broadly have a similar, particularly in the context of third wave marketization. Now, other disciplines have a different religion. I mean, economists believe perhaps in freedom and efficiency. You know, so they have a different... It would be nice if we all sort of recognize the religion that underpins our disciplines. And so we don't present ourselves as somehow neutral scientists all the time. So that would allow a discourse about the values of what we all share as academics. But the danger is, and again, I'm, I guess I'm sort of, uh, this is a problem bringing social, I'm a social scientist here, but what I'm suggesting is that we have to recognize the value foundations upon which our disciplines are built. That is not to proselytize, but to recognize that you cannot actually even have a science without value foundations. So, that should be part and parcel of the reflexive discussion in the university. So I am trying to broaden the idea of religion. But it's an interesting idea that religion is what makes good people bad. Mm. I could think of other things that make good. Mm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. John. Yeah. 
absolutely. I mean, this is obviously, you know, it, it, the, 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 the market, let's call it, ideology is very deeply rooted in, you might even use the Bourdieu's in with habitus. It's basically so deeply rooted. How does one dislodge that? And, you know, and it's always a mystery to sociologists at least, and perhaps other social scientists, as to why people adhere to a market ideology when it seems to be against their material interests. That you know you may be without a job and you blame yourself because you've been lazy or you, you, you didn't go to school or, you know, I mean, there are, there are many ethnographies that talk just, and Bruce is, 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 is nodding his head, he knows, knows those. I mean, so, it, so it's very deep. So it's, it's, like, it's like witchcraft, you know. When, when, when Evans Pritchard talks about witchcraft amongst the Azandi, there's no way of convincing the Azandi that there's witch, that they, you can't make any logical arguments every time they've got an answer. So, how does one dislodge that? Well, I think what sociology teaches is that social movements often sometimes have an effect of dislodging. You know, Marx used to say that when the working class gets together and organizes itself, it will dissolve the muck of ages. That's what you're talking about, the muck of ages. And um, so, you know, so that's one way of thinking about it. Social movements are trans often transformative. But, you know, it, 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 it does involve some, it's not just a matter of people change, rethinking things. That's not going to work. It has to be some engagement, deep engagement in their lives. And so we have to, in some sense, facilitate such deep engagement in people's lives and in the process dialogue with them. So this is, this is hard. Social movements or some deep engagement with people in their lives. Yes, yeah, so it, it, but yes, I think there has to be... A, for people to transform this, to, for people to begin to question the, uh, the dominant perspective on markets, the pro-market position, I think, yeah, I think that uh, it's essential that it, it can only come through some sort of practice in which they come to believe something different. So that some they have, they've got to be taken out of the, 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 the ruts of their lives. That's... But yes, absolutely. But that's precisely because of the, this problem, this whole situation is so desperate. And so that's why, that's why I'm saying that the university has to play a different role than it has been. Michael, can we have one more question? And then after that, we'll have a reception outside, and we can break into smaller groups. Uh, a student. My name is Tom Chartrand. I'm a graduate student in applied math, so I didn't even oh, raise my hand Oh, fantastic! Uh, <laughs> uh, this question has nothing to do with that, but I was hoping you could uh, comment on a recent example of the university in crisis that you hadn't mentioned, uh, and that is the student movement in Quebec, which uh -huh. seems to have successfully, at least for now, resisted the proposed tuition increases, um, and particularly the role of a strong student movement in leading that resistance, particularly a student movement with strong ties to leftist political organizations. Strong ties to? To leftist politics. Yeah. Yeah, well, Quebec is a very peculiar place. <laughs> I mean, it follows on from John's question. Because Canada, first of all, is very different from the United States. I mean, it, it recognized the existence of somehow a sort of social democracy or a sort of welfare state. You know, the le there is a sort of labor movement. I mean, yes, it's had left and right politics, um, but, you know, still, it is a more civilized place. And, <laughs> and, and Quebec, and Quebec is, is off the chart in those terms. It really is. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's a, it's a genuine social democracy. I mean, it, is a, it has a genuine, uh, it has a genuine it sort of provides genuine security for people, has a relatively well-developed welfare system. And so in that political context, where you have a different political culture, the struggles of students, A, are more likely to, to, be, to form solidarity themselves, more likely to form solidarity with people outside, and more likely to actually change things. Because you're not dealing with this extreme market, marketization that we face in in the United States, across the border. I mean, it's, so I, I think it's, all, it's the exception that proves the rule. Um, so, I, I, yeah, and, and, and so I, all these exceptions have got to me, and, and I mentioned the Chilean one also, and they were not so successful, of course, but uh, it, they were successful, perhaps, in quite, not just mobilized, but successful, because their demands were, in some sense, recognized as legitimate. 
Um, yeah, so we'll see how long it lasts. Uh, but, uh, but I think, yes, I think, I think that's what we have to do. We have to go around, and that's what I think one should do. Uh, it's the last question. So I think as, as, as engineers or as, 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 as people in command in literature or sociology, anthropology, we, we should, when we, and we do increasingly move across national boundaries, go around the world and look, search out interesting cases where things are done differently. We are so committed to the way that we do things. We, we've got to open our imagination about how we organize the world around us. We need to have some sort of concrete instantiations of things doing done differently in different places. And then think about how they may, in fact, be translated into our own lives. So I think that, again, is a role that we play as academics, searching out in the nooks and crannies of the world for alternative visions of how things could be organized. Because we live in a world where things look natural, inevitable, and eternal. We've got to somehow, we've got to somehow shake that, somehow. And I think, as academics, that's our responsibility, to open people's minds and imaginations as to what is possible, which is how Ralph Hexter introduced the talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. You. And we'll have a reception outside. Everybody is welcome to join. I think Michael will be able to spend another 45 minutes with us. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.